Hello. Today we'll continue our series of lectures on behavioral science. The topic we're going to cover today is sexuality. And I suppose that in as much as sexuality is always fun and interesting, uh, we'll divide this topic in two lectures. So today we'll cover lecture one and uh, the next lecture will cover the second part of uh, sexuality. Sexuality, uh, very much as aggression, is a very important topic in uh, behavioral science. Uh, well, because, I mean, what's not related to sex, right? Everything is related to sex. <laughs> Uh, from a medical point of view, uh, sexuality is very important uh, because there are some psychiatric conditions that have a lot to do with sex and there are also some sexual dysfunctions uh, that we'll cover. Although we'll not cover sexual dysfunctions today, we'll cover sexual, sexual dysfunctions in the next lecture. So keep in mind that all these topics uh, will appear in the USMLE, so at the end of this uh, uh, lecture uh, we'll do some review questions. Uh, with items that resemble the ones that appear in uh, U.S. Simile. Now, sexuality is not just about uh, you know uh, the proper act of having sex uh, with someone else, but it also, from a medical point of view, has to do with uh, biological differences between the sexes and uh, also psychological differences uh, between genders. So we'll cover some of those topics today. So let's begin with considering, uh, from a biological point of view, how do sexes come about? I mean, what is the process uh, by which uh, uh, boys and girls become differentiated uh, from the moment they're birth, uh, from the moment they're born? And this actually happens uh, well even before they're born. So there is a prenatal physical sexual development. Now, as probably you learned in the genetics 101 or even in high school genetics, uh, the genetic difference between boys and girls is uh, the XX chromosome and the XY chromosome. So in boys, uh, the Y chromosome is present and this Y chromosome has the testing determining factor gene. Uh, so uh, uh, according to which uh, of uh, these uh, alleles you have, which types of chromosome, whether you have XX. If you're XX, you turn out to be a girl. If you have XY, uh, you turn out to be a boy. Now, there are some cases where you may genetically be a boy or a girl, depending on the chromosomes that you have, but uh, prenatal physical sexual development uh, may have some alterations and that may affect uh, the way you turn out to be. Uh, and this mostly has to do with hormones. So you may be genetically of one sex, but if you have a different endocrine development in, during your prenatal or uh, phase of development, then that may alter uh, the, the, the sexual, your sexual development. So genetically you may turn out to be a boy, but uh, when you're born, uh, well, uh, your genitalia uh, may resemble your genitalia and your behavior may resemble more that of a girl. So there are some uh, important conditions that uh, we should know. Uh, it's important to understand that it's not only genes; and all hormones also play a role. And androgen hormones direct the differentiation of male internal and external uh, genitalia. So uh, both genes and hormones will uh, ultimately decide uh, what your genitalia will, will be. Uh, so there are some cases of intersexuality. And intersexuality, uh, well, as I was saying, is, uh, I mean, when you're born, you're, you're assigned either one sex. You're either a boy or a, or a girl. And in most cases, uh, in the overwhelming majority of cases of uh, when people are born, they're easily assigned to either sex. But there is a very small percentage of uh, people that are born uh, that it's not so easy to assign them to either one sex. And these people are, are called intersexuals. And intersexuality is the condition where, uh, you know, uh, the, the sex that the person belongs to is ambiguous. Uh, now, you may say, well, it's easy to determine just by taking a look at the genes, but uh, no, it's not that easy because, because of hormonal factors, uh, genitalia may turn, out, may turn out to be different. So, there are many intersexual conditions, and we'll take a look at uh, some of them. Uh, for instance, there could be an absence of androgen hormones. 
So uh, in this case, even if you have an XY chromosome, and genetically you're supposed to be a boy, uh, uh, if there is an absence of uh, androgen hormones, remember that those hormones are have the function of, a, of a, let's say, a determining um, uh, how your genitalia will be. Uh, so in, the, in, in this condition of absence of androgen hormones, it may be that uh, you have an XY chromosome, but that nevertheless your genitalia uh, will still uh, be female. So, uh, that's one condition. Another condition is androgen uh, insensitivity syndrome. So in this case, uh, the testes secrete androgen, but the cells do not respond to androgen, and as a result, uh, you have a female genotype. So in this case, uh, you have both uh, XY chromosomes, so genetically you're uh, supposed to be a boy, and uh, you do have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, hormones that are more frequently found in boys, right? Androgen. Uh, however, uh, although the fact that, that your body secretes androgen, the cells do not respond well to the androgen, and as a result, uh, you, you develop a female uh, phenotype. So genetically, you may be a boy, but in the phenotype, uh, you are, resemble more a female. Uh, another condition, excessive adrenal androgen and this is when uh, uh, you may be a girl you may be have an XX chromosome uh, but your body may secrete uh, too much uh, uh, androgen hormones and in that case uh, the result will be masculinized uh, female genitalia um, there are some other uh, intersexuality conditions that don't really have so much to do with hormones but with other causes uh, so let's take a look at a few of them. There's first of all penile agenesis, and this is uh, boys that are born uh, without penises. There's also vagina agenesis, and well, this is the other way around. These are girls that are born without uh, vaginas. Uh, there is Kleinefelter's syndrome, and this is uh, these are boys that have, of course, XY chromosome, but they may have an additional X uh, chromosome. So in this case, you would have uh, XXY chromosome. Instead of having the traditional 46 chromosomes that we all do have, you would have 47. And of course, uh, this is part of the chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, Down syndrome is probably the most famous uh, chromosomal abnormality, although uh, because Down syndrome uh, is not concerned with the XX syndrome or the XX chromosome or the XY chromosome, uh, Down syndrome is not related to intersexuality. But uh, chromosomal abnormalities are uh, they, they are some medical conditions that uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them uh, have some incidence on mental uh, disability or, or on intellectual disability or mental retardation, as it used to be known. So some of these intersexual conditions may also have uh, as symptoms some uh, uh, intellectual disabilities, although not all of them. Uh, in klein syndrome, uh, usually uh, the symptoms here are not so pronounced and uh, the diagnosis for klein syndrome um, may usually be a little bit delayed uh, because uh, patients uh, don't exhibit the symptoms until much later in their development. Uh, but eventually it may turn out, they may turn out to be diagnosed as uh, intersexual. Remember, intersexuality is not just one condition, it's a series of conditions uh, that result either from chromosomal abnormalities or from some problems in, uh, in the hormonal uh, development, especially during the, uh, the, the prenatal uh, uh, sexual development phase. Uh, another chromosomal uh, abnormality that uh, also influences uh, or that also results in another intersexual condition is a Turner syndrome. And then this is uh, for girls. Uh, these are girls that are born with only one chromosome. So in klein syndrome, people have uh, 47 chromosomes, and it's uh, males with an additional X chromosome. In Turner syndrome, uh, patients have uh, 45 uh, chromosomes because they're lacking uh, one uh, chromosome. They only have one X chromosome, so they turn out to be girls. Uh, but they also have uh, some uh, other symptoms uh, that they may eventually uh, result in. Uh, they're, they're not in, in the case of Turner syndrome. Uh, they don't have a, in, they ha they usually have normal intelligence, but they have other debilitating uh, symptoms uh, in, in some physiological features. So, what can doctors do in the case of intersexuality? What's the treatment? 
Well, usually uh, they work with a sex assignment. So, I mean, depending on, regardless of the genetic makeup, uh, they will assign sex on the basis of the phenotype. I mean, we'll, uh, let's say uh, uh, someone is genetically a boy because they have XY syndrome, but because of some hormonal uh, uh, problem, they may resemble genitalia that are more similar to girls. Well, in that case, uh, they, usually what the doctor treatment, the doctor's procedure here will be to assign them to a sex that is uh, that resembles more uh, the, their genitalia and other uh, uh, outward as uh, physical features that they may have. Uh, most physicians do not recommend rushing surgery in order to modify uh, genitalia. Uh, let the, what physicians uh, usually ask, uh, recommend is, uh, you know, waiting for a little bit longer until a proper decision can be can be made, screening uh, the sexual development of the person. So most intersexual babies do not need immediate surgeries. So that's why uh, most physicians uh, do not recommend rushing this. And um, there are some sad stories regarding inter intersexuality. There was a famous case of uh, Diver, David Peter Reimers. Uh, this was a boy um, who, when, who as, as soon as he was born, he underwent circumcision. Uh, but the circumcision turned out to be uh, uh, quite tragic because uh, during the procedure, uh, his penis was amputated. So there was a famous uh, doctor, Dr. John Money who argued that uh, if this boy's penis was amputated, that would be no problem because if he was raised as a girl and he was given some home additional hormones, uh, he could easily change uh, from one sex uh, to the other. Uh, so Dr. John Money, uh, he believed that uh, he could change sex from infancy solely with uh, genital modification and gender socialization. But this, uh, not turn, this didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, David Peter Reimer, who was the patient, uh, although he was eventually raised as a girl uh, because he had no penis, uh, he always felt as a boy and he was severely disturbed by this and he ultimately committed suicide. And Dr. John Money was criticized uh, significantly for having pushed uh, too much uh, his idea that, uh, you know, with just uh, raising a, a boy as a girl, he would eventually feel as a, feel as a girl and that there would be no problem with that. And no, it seems like uh, biology is deeper than that. And that if you have, uh, uh, if if you are first of all genetically a boy, and also you have a, a hormonal development that uh, make you feel more like a boy, then no matter, uh, regardless of whether or not your genitals are changed, uh, that's uh, because of some surgical procedure, and that's not gonna change things so easily. So. Even during prenatal uh, psychosexual development, there are some differences uh, between boys and girls. So, um, gender difference in some brain areas result from different exposure to gonadal hormones. Uh, so, androgen insensitivity syndrome usually results in a female gender identity, female gender role, and sexual uh, preference uh, for men. So, the way hormones work out uh, before you are born. Uh, ultimately have some significant influence on uh, how you feel to be and maybe this has to do with uh, gender dysphoria and the sense of gender identity. Uh, gender dysphoria is a mental disorder that we'll get shortly to. Uh, gender identity is the sense of self as male or female that is developed at about uh, three years old. So uh, if you remember uh, from our lecture on uh, developmental psychology uh, we studied how uh, at around three years old, boys and girls begin to understand, well, who's a boy and who's a girl, and they begin to feel identified with either gender. Uh, so this is the sense of uh, gender identity. Now, gender dysphoria is, a, and this is a mental disorder that is categorized in the DSM-5. It used to be uh, called uh, gender identity disorder. This is uh, when the patient uh, feels that he's not living in the body and that he feels most comfortable with in terms of gender. So someone may have a uh, uh, someone may have been assigned uh, as, as a man in, in terms of gender because of their uh, uh, because of their genitalia and so on, but they may still feel uh, like a woman. Uh, so this is called gender dysphoria because they're not happy with the gender they have been assigned, and of course this causes some uh, distress. 
Uh, it is estimated that between 0 0.5 and 1% uh, uh, of the world population uh, suffer from uh, gender dysphoria. So that's the epidemiology of uh, gender dysphoria. Uh, in adulthood, it, it, this varies because uh, someone may have a gender identity uh, or gender dysphoria uh, during their childhood, but uh, they may eventually overcome it. And the DSM-5 specifies different criteria for uh, child for children and for adults and we'll get to that shortly um, in adulthood uh, it's much more common for uh, biological men to feel uh, like women than for biological women to feel like men so uh, in adulthood there is a three to one ratio uh, male uh, female uh, uh, gender dysphoria as you probably know, this has been in the news uh, in, over the last few years because of some uh, very high profile cases, such as this one that we have here, Bruce Jenner. Uh, I, I was surprised, that I didn't really know his story all that well, but you know, uh, preparing for this lecture, I was surprised to find out that he was quite a muscular type of guy and that he was an athlete. And uh, he eventually uh, made this transition uh, towards uh, uh, being a woman. Uh, there have been some people that claim that maybe media exposure uh, to this uh, topic is increasing uh, the disorder itself. Now most psychiatrists will reject this hypothesis, uh, but I think uh, some consideration should be given to it, uh, because in other uh, mental disorders, such as uh, dissociative identity disorder, what's called multiple personality disorder, that used to be an extremely rare disorder. Uh, but uh, the media began to portray uh, movies and series and books uh, about people who developed uh, multiple personalities. And as soon as the media began to develop, uh, to, to portray those cases, uh, all of a sudden uh, it, it apparently became something much more common in terms of uh, epidemiology. Uh, some people are making, are claiming that this could also be the case uh, with gender dysphoria. I mean, so much attention is given to this in media that um, maybe people who would never develop this uh, disorder, uh, media exposure uh, may eventually uh, increase uh, the epidemiological status of, of this uh, disorder. Uh, psychiatrists are, are very skeptical of this hypothesis, but, you know, I'm just uh, mentioning it here because uh, it has been open to debate. So let's go to what the DSM-5 has to say about uh, gender dysphoria. Uh, let's consider, first of all, gender dysphoria in children. So the criteria of the DSM-5 is, first of all, for children, uh, in order to diagnose this, it's, first of all, an incongruence between one's assigned gender and experience for at least six months with at least six of these symptoms. First of all, a strong desire to be the other gender, a desire for cross-dressing, a desire for cross-gender uh, roles in place. So if you're a boy and you like to play with uh, Barbies, Barbie dolls, or if you're a girl and you like to play, uh, I don't know, with, truck, with trucks or machine guns, uh, well, that could be symptom number three. Uh, and I'm sorry, symptom number four. Also, preference for playmates of the other gender. Remember that it is uh, during this phase of development, it is quite normal. Uh, for children to prefer to play with uh, other children of their own gender. If they have a strong preference for playmates of the other gender, then they may, this may be one of the symptoms that is uh, taken into account uh, for uh, criteria for diagnosis. Uh, rejection of gender toys, this had to do with the previous symptoms. Dislike of one's sexual anatomy. Uh, desire for others' uh, genders and or sexual uh, anatomy. So, you know, this if you're a boy, you dislike your penis and you would like to have a, a vagina. And if you're a girl, well, the other way around. Now, in order, as in every, as in almost every mental, dis every other mental disorder, in order for this to be diagnosed, this has to cause distress or impairment. I mean, if the person uh, doesn't feel uh, that he's uh, the gender that he has been assigned with, but that doesn't cause distress or impairment, well, then that's not uh, considered a disorder uh, because in order for it to be, uh, in order for uh, some behavior, some mental pattern to be considered a psychiatric disease, a mental disorder, it has to cause distress. That's one of the main differences between uh, pathological uh, behavior and normal behavior.
This can also be diagnosed uh, for adults. So there is also gender dysphoria in adults. Uh, this is the DSM-5 criteria for uh, gender dysphoria in adults. Um, well, first of all, uh, an incongruence between the assigned gender and the experienced gender for at least six months with two or more of these symptoms. In the case of children, it's six. In the case of adults, it's only two or more. And then again, we have an uh, incongruence between one's experience, sex, and one's uh, sexual characteristics. Uh, desire to be rid of one's uh, sex characteristics. A desire for the other sex characteristics. So if you're a man and you have this disorder, you say, oh, I wish I didn't have penis and, you know, that I, I wish I was given a vagina. Uh, desire to be of the other gender. Desire to be treated as the other gender and conviction of having feelings of the other gender. So any, if you have two or more of those symptoms, then you uh, meet uh, criteria A, criterion A. And uh, you also need to meet criterion B, and again, that is a distress or impairment. So we're not really sure what are the causes of gender dysphoria. Uh, bear in mind that this is something that psychiatry is only starting to deal with. And, uh, you know, the high-profile cases in the media is giving it more attention. But uh, the understanding of this disorder is still in its infancy. And, you know, there are some people... Uh, gender dysphoria is becoming quite controversial because of the LGBT movement and so on. And there are some people who are trying to depathologize uh, gender dysphoria, to say that this is not really a disorder, it's just a way of living, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, there are some people, also from the LGBT community, who are saying, well, no, look, but people are suffering. So, because uh, when they don't feel part of the, uh, of the assigned gender, so they should uh, be given help. And, and there are some, yet some other people who say that there shouldn't be, and these are, these are the more radical feminists and the more radical uh, uh, people that, begun, that belong to the queer community or the LGBT community, and these people say that uh, that division between uh, genders is arbitrary and that gender and sex is a, sec it's a social construction and that uh, we shouldn't uh, really have uh, divisions between uh, men and women. And uh, to a certain extent, all the toilet uh, controversies in the United States about whether or not there should be uh, uh, only two types of toilets, but, but whether there should also be additional toilets for additional genders, well, this, that all, all of that forms part of this uh, debate. So, uh, this is only beginning to come up in public discussion, and psychiatry uh, is only beginning to understand some of the causes and what are the possible treatments for these conditions. So, one of the, main, uh, one of the possible causes for uh, gender dysphoria could be uh, altered uh, prenatal brain exposure to sex hormones. So, if you're genetically a boy, but during your prenatal behavior, uh, your prenatal development, your brain was exposed to sex hormones that are, that correspond actually to the other sex, then they may eventually uh, cause, as a child or as an adult, uh, gender dysphoria. Uh, the treatment, well, the treatment is, uh, is tricky again, because uh, there is a lot of debate on this. Uh, the first line of treatment is usually supportive psychotherapy. So if someone has gender dysphoria, well, the recommended option here is uh, maybe uh, going to the psychiatrist or the psychologist, uh, you know, to figure out the, the problems that are going through and maybe using uh, some, uh, some psychotherapeutical approach, either cognitive behavioral therapy or maybe group therapy, uh, in order to overcome some of the distress that it comes as a result of uh, gender dysphoria. Now, if that is not enough, well, uh, some physicians have recommended hormone therapy. So, I mean, if you're a man and you feel more like a woman, then maybe you could be provided with uh, hormones that are, uh, um, that, uh, are, are, are more proper uh, of, the, of the female gender, and that way uh, you may eventually make a transition. And uh, if still that's not enough, then, you know, a full transition could be made with a sex uh, reassignment surgery. And um, there have been many of these performed. Okay, so apart from that, let's talk also about gender roles in society. Uh, well, a gender role is the expression of gender in society. And that is how society expects you to behave. That's your gender, which is different from sex. I mean, sex is... 
uh, your actual uh, biological characteristics. Uh, gender role is the way society expects you to behave. So there is a societal pressure to conform to gender stereotypes. And of course, uh, unlike sex, uh, which is universal, you know the difference between boys and girls. I mean, it is universally accepted that boys have uh, penises and girls have vaginas. When it comes to gender, this varies cross-culturally. Uh, in some cultures, uh, uh, men are expected to do some things. In other cultures, uh, women are expected to do something, some, some other things. Now, even though there are uh, cultural variations in gender expectations, let's not make too much of it because there are some universals. I mean, universally, uh, men are expected to participate more in uh, army professions. Uh, I mean, universally, uh, soldiers have uh, been uh, men and uh, women have done other types of uh, tasks in, in society. One may say, well, but look, there is the Amazons. Well, yeah, but the Amazons are probably myths. Uh, and even if there were some remote society where the warriors were not males but females, uh, that wouldn't really that wouldn't be really statistically significant. So there are some uh, uh, universal uh, tendencies that uh, some roles are performed by men and some other roles are performed uh, by women. Now, of course, this is changing because even in the case of soldiers, there are now many female soldiers in, in the American. Uh, forces and especially for instance in the Israeli forces in Israel uh, women have a st very strong participation in the armed forces and just because uh, universally there have been some uh, gender uh, roles assigned to one gender and not to the other that doesn't mean that that cannot change uh, this is what in philosophy would be called a naturalistic uh, fallacy so just because something has always been the case that doesn't imply that it has to continue being that way uh, but it is nevertheless true that uh, although there are some mm, cultural variations regarding gender roles, uh, there, for, for instance, uh, I, I usually use this uh, humorous example. I mean, in Western society, there is the expectation that um, men wear pants and women uh, wear skirts. Uh, but if you go to Scotland, uh, well, women, or, or even in Fiji, uh, men over there, uh, they're culturally expected to wear, in the case of Scotland, the kilt, or in the case of Fiji, uh, skirts that are, resemble the ones that uh, females wear. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, some, that's something that's uh, socially constructed. Uh, society imposes that on the gender, and it doesn't necessarily have to be universal. But again, I want to emphasize that there are some other gender roles that are universal. And if they are universal, they may have a biological basis. Although not necessarily. Just because some trait is universally found across culture, that we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that, it's a, that it has a biological basis. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some gender roles uh, that are indeed uh, universal. Let's talk about sexual orientation. Uh, this is always an interesting topic, of course. Uh, sexual orientation, we can define it as the preference for people of the same sex, the opposite sex, or both. So you can be homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. And as we talked about in a previous lecture, uh, during, especially when we talked about uh, developmental psychology, when people begin to experience uh, their sexual preferences, there may be a time of sexual experiencing uh, with, uh, with different uh, types of orientation. And... Uh, some uh, psychologists have proposed rather a continuum or a spectrum of uh, between uh, homosexuality and heterosexuality. I mean, uh, some people may not be entirely either homosexual or heterosexual, but you know, uh, they may uh, they may uh, be placed on a continuum. So sexual orientation is not the same as gender identity or gender role. I mean, uh, you may be a man. Uh, biologically, you may very much feel like a man. You may do, uh, you may perform uh, uh, masculine roles in society, and nevertheless, you may still like, uh, you may still prefer other men when it comes to sex. So, uh, being gay, if you're a man, it's not about feeling like a woman. And this is a common uh, media myth that you know all, all gay men are somehow feminine, fem are somehow feminine, and that they resemble a woman. It is true. That from a biological point of view, some uh, biological characteristics of uh, homosexual men uh, resemble a little bit uh, uh, some of the uh, biological characteristics of uh, heterosexual women. 
but we shouldn't make too much of it uh, because as I'm saying uh, gender identity is not the same as sexual orientation uh, just because uh, you have a preference a sexual preference uh, for men if you're a man that doesn't mean that uh, you feel as a woman uh, it's very interesting to point out that in the DSM we are currently in the fifth edition but up until the third edition uh, homosexuality uh, was considered a pathology uh, not anymore uh, so uh, you sh will not find uh, the homosexuality listed as a sect as a mental disorder in the DSM uh, but in the past it used to be included uh, and the the case that uh, homosexuality is included uh, was formerly included as a disorder that has been an argument for many people who oppose the discipline of psychiatry because some people say that psychiatry is not a real branch of medicine but rather it is a political tool that is used by some groups uh, to pathologize uh, those behaviors uh, that uh, some people just don't like and the case of homosexuality is one of them now i think that anti-psychiatrists in the case of homosexuality they may have a point and in fact they do have a point uh, but I think they would overgeneralize to say that all of psychiatry is uh, politically or morally uh, motivated because that's not the case. I mean, I think uh, there is a genuine objective difference between um, pathological behavior and uh, normal behavior. Now, although homosexuality uh, is no longer included in the DSM, there is some discussion about whether or not uh, Ego dystonic homosexuality should be included. And ego dystonic homosexuality is a sexual orientation or attraction that is at odds with one's idealized self image, causing anxiety or distress and a desire to change one's orientation or become more comfortable with one's sexual orientation. So, uh, ego dystonic uh, homosexuals would be those uh, gays and lesbians who are not happy with being gays and lesbians they are uh, uh, they, they don't they don't feel satisfied with their own sexual orientation and that causes distress uh, now the dsm-5 does not include ego dystonic homosexuality as a disorder uh, but there's some debate about this i mean there's some people who say that well yeah sure homosexuality uh, should not be considered a mental disorder uh, because it doesn't cause distress it doesn't cause uh, problems to other people it's just a way of living However, if homosexuality does cause distress in the sense that people are not happy with their uh, sensual orientation, then maybe it should be included as a form of mental disorders. And in that case, it wouldn't just be homosexuality as a disorder, but rather ego dystonic homosexuality. Now, one of the great questions in psychology is uh, why do people turn out to be gay? Uh, what is the etiology of homosexuality? And there's no definite answer to this. Uh, we can only consider some tentative answers. Uh, first of all, there may be alterations in the levels of uh, prenatal sex hormones. So increased androgens in females and decreased androgens in males uh, may eventually uh, influence uh, someone's uh, sexual orientation. And this is why I was saying that uh, biologically, it could be the case that uh, Homosexual men may resemble, um, in some aspects, uh, heterosexual women, and homosexual women uh, may resemble, uh, in some biological aspects, uh, heterosexual men. But again, let's not make too much of this. Um, it has also been found that some anatomic changes in the hypothalamic uh, nuclei uh, during uh, the prenatal phase of sexual development uh, may occur uh, due to prenatal hormone exposure and those anatomic changes in that area of the brain uh, may actually, may actually uh, lead to uh, homosexuality. Uh, it has been found that uh, gay, uh, homosexuals and heterosexuals do have some differences in brain anatomy and, and brain physiology. Um, uh, lesbians and heterosexual men have a more asymmetrical uh, brain and the right side uh, of the brain tends to be a little bit bigger in lesbians and heterosexual men whereas uh, homosexual men and heterosexual women have a more symmetrical brain and now how does that exactly cause homosexuality 
Well, we don't know, but we do know that there is a correlation between these brain features and uh, sexual uh, orientation. And apart from the brain, there are other uh, biological correlations that are quite interesting and uh, they're not properly uh, predictors of homosexuality, but they have a strong uh, uh, correlation. Uh, there's first of all the digit ratio. Uh, higher prenatal exposure to testosterone may decrease index ring ratio. So homosexual men uh, have, tend to have a higher ratio. Um, so in the case of homosexual men, uh, the index finger uh, may be longer than the ring finger. And you can test it on yourself. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> if your index finger is longer and you're a man, that doesn't necessarily imply that you're homosexual. Uh, but as I'm saying, there has been uh, some correlations done and the correlations turn out to be rather strong. Um, there is also a high correlation between heterosexuality and being right-handed. So uh, uh, homosexuality and left-handedness are also uh, strongly correlated. Uh, but again, I must emphasize that these are only working hypotheses and, you know, so far we're not so sure why people turn out to be gay and they're just uh, correlations. There's always a possibility that uh, sexual orientation may have a genetic origin. So apparently some markers on chromosome X have been found uh, with uh, homosexual populations. Uh, and, you know, that's a working hypothesis that maybe uh, some of those markers in chromosome X uh, have uh, may actually uh, uh, determine someone's uh, sexual orientation. Uh, homosexuality has some rather high heritability. Remember that heritability is a, it's a measure of deciding how much of variation regarding one trait is due to genetics. So when uh, twins have been compared, uh, they find out that uh, the heritability is of 0.45 and when it comes to uh, uh, sexual orientation. Now, a great puzzle, a great evolutionary puzzle in regarding homosexuality is that, okay, if there are gay genes, I mean, if, if, if homosexuality has a genetic basis, how can those genes be passed to the next generation? And let's say that you have a gene for being gay. Well, if you're gay, you're not going to have children. And if you're not going to have children, then how is it possible that those genes that you have for being gay uh, will persist in the gene pool? I mean, how can gay genes be passed? And there are various theories regarding this. Uh, it could be, and some evolutionary psychologists have proposed this, it could be that a low dose of gay genes uh, may not be enough to make someone gay, but uh, may make you more sexually attractive uh, to women. Uh, so uh, that is how gay genes may be passed. And when someone has a, a, a really big dose of uh, those uh, genes, well, you may be sexually attractive but eventually you may turn out to be gay. So you will not be able to pass those genes yourself, but other people with lower doses may actually uh, be at a greater advantage for passing those genes. I mean, that's one mechanism uh, for uh, passing gay genes to the next generation. Another very famous hypothesis in evolutionary psychology regarding uh, uh, genes and, uh, and, and gays and homosexuality is the gay uncle theory. And according to this theory, it could be that uh, those people that have uh, genes for being gay may also, those very same genes may also be responsible for increasing uh, altruistic behavior towards uh, other people that are related to them. Now remember this goes back to Hamilton's theory. Uh, well in this case, if you, according to the hypothesis, if you have uh, genes for being gay, those very same genes could also uh, make you uh, metaphorically speaking, a better uncle, so you could take good care of your nephews and nieces. And if that is the case, then inasmuch as those nephews and nieces uh, carry your same genes, well, by helping them out, you're also helping them to uh, spread their own genes, and that is how the gay gene can be also spread. So uh, maybe you will not have children of your own, but if you take care of other children that are genetically close to you and you are gay, then that is how your gay genes may be passed to the next generation. 
And uh, more recently, there is a famous uh, biologist, his name is uh, Gregory Coch uh, Cochran, and he has put forth the hypothesis that maybe uh, homosexuality doesn't really have anything to do with uh, genetics, uh, but it may actually uh, be a, a virus. <laughs> now, this has caused some controversy because uh, gay people have been offended, uh, but uh, I think it's a working hypothesis, and you know, uh, the jury's still out about whether or not um, maybe uh, uh, homosexuality may actually be a virus. Now, of course, viruses have very negative connotations, but this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I mean, here Cochrane is not implying that uh, being gay is a pathological condition. He's just claiming that the etiology uh, may actually be viral. Birth order uh, may also have to do something with uh, male homosexuality. So uh, it has been found that the more older brothers a man has from the same mother, the greater the probability is that he will be homosexual. And why does this happen? Well, it has to do with uh, the, what's, what has been called the maternal immunization hypothesis. Now, according to this hypothesis, Pregnant women develop an immune reaction to an antigen that turns the male fetus heterosexual. So the more pregnancies a mother has, the stronger the immune reaction from the mother towards the fetus. Uh, so in that case, uh, the younger brother, uh, in as much as the mother has had uh, more pregnancies, that has given the mother uh, the chance to develop a stronger immune reaction against that antigen. So that antigen in the younger brother uh, is weakened, and in that sense, uh, it may not uh, fulfill its function properly of turning the male fetus uh, heterosexual. Uh, and there is a statistical correspondence that uh, there is a much greater chance of uh, a man turning out to be gay if he has many older brothers uh, from the same woman. But again, this is only a hypothesis as the previous ones, uh, so we shouldn't make too much of it. Uh, let's address some common myths about homosexuality that are usually exploited in the media. Uh, first of all, the, there is the idea that homosexuality and pedophilia are related, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, the, the Catholic Church has um, unfortunately uh, given voice to this argument, but uh, it has been uh, refuted. Uh, there is also the common myth that uh, people turn out to be gay because they have been sexually abused. Uh, that's also not true. Uh, it is nevertheless true that, as we, uh, you know, as we studied in the last lecture, that sexual abuse may be an etiological factor in the case of pedophilia. If you were abused, sexually abused as a child, that increases the risk that you may become yourself a sexual abuser. Um, but th that doesn't apply to homosexuality. Uh, it's also a myth that uh, if you are raised... Uh, uh, by uh, someone, uh, if you're raised by gay parents or if you, have, if you don't have a role model or a parent of the same sex, then you may turn out to be gay. So if you're raised by your mother and your sisters, but there are no men in the household, then uh, if you're a man, you will turn out to be gay. That, that's a myth. Uh, remember that uh, uh, homosexuality either has a strong genetic component or a hormonal uh, component. Uh, but uh, being raised uh, by people of the other gender, that, that doesn't have any influence whatsoever. Uh, it's also false that uh, homosexuals have a shorter life expectancy and that they have a poor mental health and that they have increased uh, substance abuse risk. Uh, it seems to be false that it's a choice. I mean, you're born with this, either due to genes or hormones or whatever else. So people just can decide to, to stop being gay and turn into heterosexual. And that is why uh, conversion therapy <laughs> is really a, a loss of time. I mean, every time conversion therapy has been tried, especially by uh, evangelical fundamentalist groups, uh, this has met a utter failure. And there have been some very high profile cases of evangelicals that have proudly claimed to have been homosexuals in the past and they now claim to be cured uh, quote-unquote cure from homosexuality and after a while well they turn out to be caught with their pants down uh, with other men uh, so you know this speaks a lot about the hypocrisy going on in conversion therapy and in uh, fundamentalist uh, circles 
Now, there are some uh, rather uncomfortable facts regarding homosexuality. It is true that gay men have a higher in incidence of, uh, or prevalence of uh, promiscuity. So it is true that gay men tend to be much more promiscuous than heterosexual men, than uh, heterosexual women, or than uh, even homosexual uh, women, than lesbians. And so this is not just a media stereotype. I mean, this is supported by facts. And uh, although there's some more controversy regarding this, there it is still a fact uh, that domestic violence rates in homosexual relations tend to be slightly higher than uh, in heterosexual relations. Although, again, the data is not conclusive. Okay, so let's talk uh, briefly about uh, biology and sexuality in adults. Uh, it's important to know that menopause uh, does not reduce uh, sex driving women. So women after, four, after 45 or 50, uh, they are still as sexual as uh, any other age. Uh, testosterone does influence libido, libido, which is sexual energy, and is uh, continuously produced uh, throughout the lifetime. So, you know, elderly people can perfectly have sex uh, just because there are some uh, changes in the development. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that they, they're not able to have sex and they have decreased libido. They may have problems, erection problems, and in the next lecture we'll cover some sexual dysfunctions, but this is different from uh, the decreased libido. Uh, psychological and physical stress may decrease testosterone levels, uh, so this is something to watch for. Uh, too much uh, stress may actually uh, make you uh, feel uh, with less uh, sexual energy. And uh, progesterone, which is found in oral anticonceptives uh, for women, may decrease uh, libido in women. So this is something that you doctors uh, should be aware of. And let's talk about uh, how uh, sexuality actually happens uh, and what are the biological correspondences to, to the sexual act it itself. Um, there is a very famous model of the sexual response cycle that was uh, devised by Master and, and Johnson. These are two famous. Uh, uh, these are two famous people who studied uh, how humans uh, interact sexually, uh, and there are basically uh, four stages in, in, in the sexual response cycle. There's first of all the excitement stage. So this is you know warming up, <laughs> so to speak. And in, during the excitement stage, uh, there is a penile erection in men. And in women, there is a clitoral erection, uh, labial swelling, uh, and vaginal lubrication, uh, lubrication in women. So this is when uh, both men and women begin to get excited. This is the excitement stage. Uh, there is also increased pulse. Uh, the blood pressure goes higher. And uh, there is a faster respiration, a nipple erection. So the nipples go up a little bit. This is during the excitement stage. I mean, this is when arousal is beginning. Uh, after that, uh, there is what's called the plateau stage. Now, it's called the plateau stage because, uh, as you will later see on the graph that I will show you shortly, uh, the, the, the line of arousal in the first stages goes immediately up. But then after a while, it becomes flat. And that, that's why it's called the plateau stage. And now during the plateau stage, uh, there is an, in the case of men, there is an increased size and upward movement of the testes. Uh, there is a secretion of a few drops of sperm containing fluid. So during this plateau stage, after examining, is when penetration uh, actually happens. Uh, during, there are some people who believe that uh, a contraceptive method is a, a coitus interruptus, and that is to say, you know, to have penetration, but just prior to the moment of orgasm, to withdraw the penis from the vagina, and they think that that's effective, but it's very risky uh, because during the uh, phase of uh, penetration, during the plateau stage, uh, there may still be a secretion of uh, a few drops of uh, sperm containing fluid. So if you really want to have contraception, you need to look for other methods. Uh, in the case of women, during the plateau stage, there is a contraction of the outer one-third of the vagina. So the vagina contracts uh, a little bit. And uh, there is a further increase in pulse, uh, blood pressure, and respiration, although that increase is not as steep as in the excitement uh, phase. 
uh, during this stage uh, there is a flushing of the chest and face so yes people do turn out to be red <laughs> or their skin turns reddish uh, <laughs> when they're having uh, sex especially during the plateau stage so after that uh, there is the organs uh, the orgasm stage uh, so this is the forcible this is when the forcible expulsion of seminal fluid happens and uh, in the case of women uh, there is a contraction of the uterus and the vagina and there is even more increase in pulse, uh, blood pressure, and respiration. So what happens after orgasm? Well, there is the resolution stage. Now in here, I mean, so far in men and women, uh, uh, the stages have been relatively similar. But in the case of the resolution stage, uh, men and women differ. Uh, for men, there is a refractory or resting period. Uh, and the length uh, varies by age and physical condition but in the case of healthy young men it's about uh, 15 or 20 minutes now this is very important here to know that in the case of women there is no refractory period or it's very little so a woman can have an orgasm and she may immediately be ready for the next orgasm in the case of men once men have an orgasm they cannot have an orgasm immediately they need their refractory period uh, so after orgasm, uh, there is muscle relaxation and uh, the return of the sexual and cardiovascular uh, systems to the mm, pre-stimulated state over 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, that's the resolution stage. Uh, here in this graph, you can see the differences between males and females. Males are blue, uh, females are, are red. So uh, in the case of men, uh, you can see how the line goes up during excitement. Uh, it's very steep. In the case of plateau, and during the plateau phase, uh, uh, the, the, the arousal keeps going up and, you know, high blood pressure and respiration and so on keeps on going, but it's a little bit more flattened because it's during the phase of uh, penetration. But it, then it steeps itself again when it reaches orgasm, and after orgasm, it decreases abruptly, and this is the refractory period. Now, in the case of females, which is the red line, uh, she may be excited, so she may have a steep increase in arousal, and during the plateau stage, she may have a very flat line, and those when that's when women have sex and don't reach orgasm, and we'll get to in the next lecture about uh, some conditions of of women that are not able to reach orgasm. Uh, but she may also, mm, after the plateau stage, she may reach orgasm. Now, there may be a very short uh, refractory period for women, so you see the line decreasing down, but she's ready again to have a new orgasm. And some sexologists and sexual therapists uh, recommend that if a woman reaches orgasm uh, after, uh, and the man reaches orgasm, well, after that, she may uh, masturbate herself, even in front of the man, that's perfectly normal to do, so that she may reach a further more orgasms because she's ready for more unlike the man after the man reaches orgasm then there is a refractory period and the blue line comes all the way down in the case of women she may reach the orgasm uh, but uh, she may continue so uh, the refractory period is it's much shorter uh, or, or actually there may even be no refractory period at all for the case of women um, let's that uh, wraps up our lecture, so let's uh, do one USMLE question uh, before we finish uh, today. So let's consider this. A 29-year-old man, uh, I'm sorry, a 29-year-old woman says that she has always felt as if she was a man in the body of a woman. Uh, physical and pelvic examinations are normal, and she is sexually attracted to heterosexual women and wants to wear men's clothes. She wants to take male hormones and she wants to undergo a mastectomy and surgical sex reversal so that she can live as a man. So the final diagnosis for this patient is most likely to be A, androgenital syndrome, B, androgen insensitive syndrome, C, gender dysphoria, D, transvestic fetishism, or E, normal. Well, she's neither A nor B because those are uh, intersexual conditions and that's not the case here i mean uh, biologically she is a woman uh, uh, both genetically and biologically and, 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 and genetically and phenotypically um, the transvestic fetishism we'll get to fetishism in, in the next uh, lecture when we cover some of the paraphilias 
but uh, no, this is not transvestic fetishism because transvestic fetishism is when people are aroused sexually by being dressed with clothes of the other gender. But this is not the case. I mean, this is not just about having sex, uh, being dressed as a man. This is wanting to live as a man. Uh, is she normal? Uh, no, she's not normal because uh, I mean, if you have a, if you are biologically a woman, then you're expected to uh, feel as a woman. So if you are biologically a woman but you feel as a man, then the correct answer here here would be uh, C, gender dysphoria.